Ever since Donald Trump won the 2016 presidential race, pundits and prognosticators have been asking, how did he do it? Well, our next guest has a theory, and it lies at the heart of his latest book. F.H. Buckley is foundation professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, and the book is titled The Republican Workers' Party, and listen to the subtitle, How the Trump Victory Drove Everyone Crazy and Why It Was Just What We Needed. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So uh, I've got to delve into that subtitle first before we get to the theme of the Republican Workers' Party. Uh, How does your book tell us about uh, the Trump victory driving everyone crazy and why it was exactly what we needed? Well, the first part's easy. It it did drive everybody crazy. Why it was needed? Well, he was addressing something that I think many people, particularly conservatives, had forgotten, which is if you have a political message— it's something you have to sell to all Americans. You can't just derive it from some abstract theories that you think were kind of written in the sky. Rather, it's got to connect with ordinary folks. And Trump did that. And he did that because he was addressing a problem that conservatives, that Republicans had certainly forgotten, and, and that is the American dream had died. The American dream was the idea that wherever you are, wherever you come from, you're going to do okay, and more importantly, your children will have it better than you did. And th- that wasn't the case anymore. I mean, that stopped. we stopped believing in that. And that fit in with this whole theme of the Make America Great Again, everyone wearing the red hats. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, again is the crucial word. We used to be that country. We stopped being that country. Why? Well, I think both right, left and right had, had simply given up on it. I mean, the left had become cocooned in its own you know, set of ideas and constituencies and didn't care about the deplorables, right? I mean, what, what would make us mobile again would be things like schools at work and an immigration system that helped ordinary Americans and draining the swamp. But the swamp employs so many of them, and the teachers' unions are the big contributors, and they weren't going to give up on any of that. They were going to talk about how they hated inequality and immobility, but they were vile hypocrites. I mean, they just didn't, you know, they were not going to change all those things which made us worse off, which made us, you know, which meant that we had to make ourselves great again. And as for the right... Well, they were lost in a whole bunch of things. They were lost in the idea of, you know, cultural conservatism and virtue and the idea that the people who didn't get ahead were opioid sniffing degenerates, the spawn of unwed mothers and all of that. And that's wrong. I mean, you know, you know, we didn't become degenerate. What we had was a dismal set of economic opportunities. And when he said, I'm going to be the greatest jobs president you've ever seen, that's what he was addressing. When he said, it's going to be a workers' party, that's what he meant. And so that's the title of the book. Yeah, and I was going to turn to that next. The The main title is the Republican Workers' Party. And in some of the promotional material, uh, it said that this is, this is the future of American presidential politics. Why right. so? Well, I drafted that line. <laughs> Well, because if you want to appeal to Americans in a presidential election, what you've got to do is hit the sweet spot of American politics. And what's that? That's cultural, that's social conservatism, which means you're a nationalist, which means you haven't forgotten your Judeo-Christian heritage, and you're also not an extreme right-winger when it comes to economic policies and the welfare net. So Trump, for example, said, you know, I don't want to just repeal Obamacare. I want to repeal and replace it with something better. And then he ran into Paul Ryan, right? I mean, so people nowadays talk about divided government. We've had divided government since 2016, you know, since Trump was elected. It's always been divided government. And the question is, can Trump bring the Republican Party along with him? Because what he has done is he's identified how to get elected. You don't just run like Ted Cruz on, I'm the most right-wing guy around, and you know, I really, I don't, you know, I don't care about ordinary people, just look at my face, right? <laughs> you know, you got to project that you care about ordinary Americans and that you're going to do something about it. I mean, the Republicans, Democrats are good at projecting that, but not so good at doing anything about it. Trump is actually bringing back jobs, and not just jobs, but wages, and by the way, the, the overtime wages are really exploding. 
So he's doing what he promised in terms of fixing our economy. That's what's going to make us great again. We are chatting with F.H. Buckley. He is foundation professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University and author of the book that we're discussing. It's titled The Republican Workers' Party. You mentioned that Trump is distinguished from, from a Ted Cruz. He's also distinguished from the Republicans like George Bush or mm. Mitt Romney, sort of the establishment types that people have known about for a long time. How does that help? him and how how could that help the future of the Republican Party? Well, with respect to, yeah, I mean, you're talking about two people whom I think are admirable people, uh, you know, nice guys who just didn't have the right message, the right ideas, and the right carry through. I mean, Bush got us involved in a bunch of wars that didn't do anything for anybody and cost us lives and billions of dollars. And, and you know, we... we Totally repudiated that. As for Mitt Romney, the guy who distinguished between, what is it, the 47% of takers and the, 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 the guys who are really producing wealth. I mean, it looked to me as if the guy who owned five homes, one of which had an elevator for his car, the guy who liked to give people a pink slip, this is not a guy who projected any great care for near Americans. So that's, the, that's not the way to go. So given what we've seen from Trump and the record over the first couple of years of his administration, uh, do you think that there is a good platform for the Republicans to, to build on or the things they, they could take on once Trump is gone and off the scene himself? Are there things other Republicans could build on that will cause them to be successful? Well, I hope so. Um, you know, I don't know who that person could be. There are a number of candidates. Tom Cotton comes to mind, somebody who figured out immigration pretty well. Um, what you've got to do is distinguish yourself from, for example, a pure libertarian right that communicates it doesn't care about social issues and all it cares about is, you know, how big is our GNP. Uh, you know, the, these are the guys who talk about being uh, socially liberal and economically right-wing. So their message to Democrats is, you know, we're really on your side when it comes to same-sex marriage and the like and abortion, and don't worry about how we feel about economics because we both know we're not going to do anything, right? So as opposed to that, you need somebody who's going to connect with ordinary Americans with respect to issues like, you know, national identity and patriotism and love in America. Uh, none of the libertarians can do that. The Trump message obviously worked for him in 2016. Does it seem like this same message is going to be one that will be a winner in 2020? Can we tell? Well, it's, uh, I'm not going to make a prediction. I'm not that stupid. Um, but I tell you, it's the message is, is going to be the same message. Uh, what's happening right now is the sort of thing we haven't seen in America since 1860. We've seen two sides so divided that they can't even talk to each other. And there's a conversation they should be having. But if all the Democrats want to do is talk about impeachment, which is, I think, where they're coming from, then there's no possibility of any kind of a, a meaningful compromise. But, you know, there, there are all these deals to be done. There are deals to be done on immigration. There are deals to be done on health care. There are de deals to be done all over the place. And um, the, the Dems just aren't interested. So we'll see how that plays out for them. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that's not a winner. I'm hoping that Americans are not so obsessed with hatred that they vote Democratic, because I don't know why else they would.